February 1940, on the frozen tundra of the Finnish countryside, a soldier, laid in the snow, takes aim at an unsuspecting enemy. The first that his foe would know about it, he would already be too late. This soldier had taken that many lives that he had now become the scourge of the Soviet army, to the point where they had superstitiously named him Belea Smert. Today, descent into darkness levels its sights at the life and times of Simo Haucha, the White Death. Early Years Simo Hauha was born on the 17th of December 1905 in the South Karelia region of Finland that borders Russia. He came from a large family, being child number seven of eight. I mean, what else are you going to do when it's cold outside? His father was named Juho, and his mother was Katrina, and the family were Lutherans who owned a farm, with everyone pitching in with the associated chores as soon as they were old enough. Young Simo, who was nicknamed Simuna by his parents and siblings, had grown up with a love of hunting and skiing, two very important skills in the harsh environments that Finland can throw at its inhabitants. As well as his daily jobs on the farm, Simona and the rest of the children received their education at the nearby school in Mietala. Military career When Simo turned 17, he decided to join the local militia, known as the White Guard, his background in hunting proved a highly transferable skill when it came to target practice. To say that Simo was a sharpshooter seems something of an inadequate statement. He quickly excelled in this, and he soon built up an impressive collection of trophies that he won from shooting competitions. But throughout this, he was not one to let this success and notoriety go to his head. He remained a very humble character, and would prefer to shun the spotlight, even making sure to stand at the back during group photos. When he turned 19, he began his compulsory military service with the newly established Finnish army. This would last for 15 months, and he served with one of the bicycle battalions. Whilst this may sound a little odd, both Italy and Japan also made use of bicycles as a way of allowing the men to move quickly without needing the extra supply problems of using horses. Hauha continued to display his prowess on the shooting range. According to his biographer and superior, Major Sara Leinen, Hauha was able to estimate distances to within a single metre margin of error up to 150 metre range. Furthermore, he asserts that Hauha was able to hit a standard-sized target at 150 metres a staggering 16 times in one minute, using a rifle that had a five-round magazine capacity. So clearly his speed and dexterity with firearms matched his impressive ability to shoot. Spoiler alert, this was going to prove exceedingly useful going forward. Hoha didn't actually have any formal sniper training until 1938, 13 years after he'd enlisted. This may sound a little strange, but it's worth noting that even despite the First World War, many world militaries did not choose to continue specific training for snipers, pretty much until the outbreak of the Second World War, by which point all of the skills and knowledge gained in the First War had to be rediscovered almost from scratch. The Winter War Uh, we may as well have a very quick look at the conflict in which our protagonist fought. The area now known as Finland had historically been fought over between Russia and Sweden down the centuries. With a gradual weakening of Sweden's power, the area had become a permanent part of the old Russian Empire right, in, right into the early 20th century. Following the Russian Revolution and the country descending into civil war, the Finns declared independence on the 6th of December 1917. By this time, Russia was in no condition to do much about it. In May the following year, the USA officially recognised Finland as a legitimate country. But the Russians were not one to forget, and with the rising of Josef Stalin, the now communist state, in 1939 began making significant territorial demands on the flimsy excuse of security reasons and protecting the city of Leningrad, which was 20 miles from the new border. During the negotiations of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, 
Russia had discussed with Germany that they wanted to invade Finland and install a communist puppet regime. Oh, those Russians. Naturally, the Finns told them to suck a fat one, and so the Red Army invaded on the 30th of November 1939, but they would find a lot more than they had bargained for. With the outbreak of the so-called Winter War, Hauha served in the 6th Company of the 34th Infantry Regiment under Lieutenant Arna Jutalainen, and fought in the Battle of Kola, in the south of the country. The two forces fought around the area of the Kola River. The terrain was exceedingly difficult for the defending forces, a fact not helped by the severe lack of supplies and resources that the Finns had to begin with. This disparity is shown by the artillery exchanges. Finnish guns were limited to around a thousand rounds a day, whereas their Russian counterparts fired 40,000 rounds a day. The Red Army had four divisions and a tank brigade at their disposal. The Finns had only one division. Despite this, the overwhelming numbers of the Red Army were blunted and held by the plucky yet severely outnumbered Finnish defenders. In the north of the engagement, elements of the 75th Division were entirely repulsed. When Jutalainen asked by his superiors, Will Kola hold? He emphatically replied, Kola will hold unless the orders are to run away. This phrase has since gone down in common Finnish phraseology as a way of expressing determination. Badass. The White Death From the get-go, Hoha was allowed free reign to do what he did best, rather than be held back with the rest of the men. He would venture forward and set up a hide for himself and wait for his quarry to make the mistake of showing themselves. Hoha was predominantly armed with two different guns. For close quarters actions, he carried a Suomi KP-31 submachine gun, a very fine if often forgotten piece of kit that fired the 9mm cartridge at a blistering 900 rounds a minute. Yet due to its hefty weight, fully automatic fire is quite controllable. Despite looking vaguely like the Russian submachine guns of the era, they are very much different. Although later, the Russians would take the 71-round drum magazine of captured KP-31s and use it in the later and much more famous Papasha 41. For his long-range work, Simo carried an M28-30 rifle a Finnish-made variant of the Russian Mosin Nagant model of 1891 bolt-action rifle that the Finns affectionately dubbed the Spitz, because of the front sight protectors and barrel looking a bit like the head of a Spitz dog. I mean, yeah, I, I can see it, kind of, I, I guess. Many in the gun community deride the Mosin Nagant as a very bad gun. Alex C of TFB TV famously dubbed it the Garbage Rod, which doesn't really make sense as an insult, but hey-ho. Having owned one myself, I can tell you that the action is very stiff feeling when the bolt is worked, and the magazine follower spring is far too complicated for what it actually needs to be. Another complaint is that the charger clips for reloading must be manually removed after being emptied, rather than the bolt being able to fling the spent clip out of the way upon chambering the first round, as pretty much every other such system does. It may seem like a petty complaint, but in a firefight, every second counts. But regardless of these nitpicking points, it was rugged and it was reliable. Perfect for the harsh environments that it would be thrown into. So, what more do you really want? Unlike most snipers, Hoha did not have a telescopic sight fitted to his rifle. One could be forgiven for thinking that this would leave him as something of a disadvantage, but there is method behind it. Sunlight can glint off the lens of a scope and thereby give away the shooter's position. Not only that, but the lens of a scope can become fogged over in extremely cold temperatures. By using iron sights, Hoha ensured that this could not happen, and there was even less to potentially go wrong, simply having to line up the front post with the U-notch rear, as you can see in this photo. And to be fair to him, he hadn't ever been trained with a scoped rifle, so he went with what he knew. He dressed himself in an all-white hooded smock over many layers of warm clothing and a white balaclava, blending himself perfectly with the deep snow-covered landscape in which he would stalk his prey. 
He would move under the cover of dark and prepare a good position in a foxhole that he made in the snow. Very cleverly, he compacted the snow around the point at which the muzzle of his rifle would be to avoid the blast of gases from the shot kicking up loose powdered snow and thus giving away his position. He would pile more snow around the hole to make it look more natural. He would remain in this hide and observe the enemy all day, if need be, never moving until it was fully dark again, which, given that this was Finland in the winter, it was not usually all that long. From these hides over the course of one hundred days, he was able to make confirmed kills with astounding rapidity. Army documents show his impressive tally. By the 22nd of December, he had killed 138 men. By the 26th of January, a further 61. And by the 17th of February, he killed another 20 and would add another 30 to that number in the remaining days of the conflict. This made for a total of 259 confirmed kills, an average of around 5 per day. Sick kill-death ratio, bruh. Although I have seen sources that quote his tally as high as 505, this could have come about from the fact that there were certain situations that allegedly were not counted, such as close-quarter firefights. The Russians could never seem to see where the mysterious shots were coming from, this would lead the troops opposing Hauha's unit to be very wary of being out in the open. The superstitious among them allegedly nicknamed him Balea Smert, the White Death. The Finns themselves gave him the nickname Taika Ampuya, or the Magic Shooter. But sadly for the Finns, his luck would not last forever. On the 6th of March 1940, the White Death would nearly meet his own maker when a bullet struck the left side of his face leaving it a ragged and bloodied mess. Both the upper and lower jaw and most of his cheek were gone. The shock knocked Hauha unconscious, and there he lay until he was evacuated by his comrades. He was mistakenly taken for dead and dumped on a pile of corpses awaiting burial. When no one knew what happened to him, his commanding officer had ordered one of the men from his unit to find him. The soldier began digging through the stack of bodies to see if Hauha was amongst them. Although still unconscious, his leg twitched, which gave hope that he might still be alive. He was taken to the nearest field hospital, and his face was cleaned and bound. He remained in a coma for a week. Rumours circulated around both Finland and Russia that the White Death had been killed. Aftermath The Winter War was a hard-fought conflict. The Finns put up a stiff and spirited defence, but ultimately, the insane weight of numbers that the Red Army was able to throw at the plucky underdogs, as well as tanks and aircraft, won out. The Treaty of Moscow was signed on the 13th of March 1940, ceding land in Karelia and islands in the Gulf of Finland, as well as the region of Sala in Lapland and the Rabachi Peninsula. Also, the port town of Hanko was leased to the Russians. On the same day that peace was declared, Simo Hauha awoke from his coma. Despite his injury, he was amused when he was shown a newspaper article that stated that he had been killed. Hauha asked for a pen and paper to write a letter to the publication to correct the record. The conflict had lasted just under three and a half months, and despite their victory, it had been a bit of a wake-up call for the Soviets. They experienced just how dogged a defender can be if they are fighting for their homes. The longer supply lines, poor troop morale and poor logistics had seen them held for far longer than it should have been on paper. No doubt there will be some that are seeing parallels with a particular current conflict concerning Russia, but until that's over and the full details are known, that'll have to be a story for another day. The Finns and the Russians would go to war again between 1941 and 1944 in a conflict known as the Continuation War which would see the Finns assisted by Nazi Germany, and the Soviets assisted by Britain in something of a proxy war, right whilst they were having a proper war, only a short distance away. Hauha did volunteer to serve in this conflict too, but he was excused due to his facial injury, which had yet to fully heal. The conflict would end in even more land ceded to the USSR in the form of the Petsamo region, along with a 12-year-long lease of the Porkala Peninsula. 
post-war and final years. Despite the overall Finnish defeat, Simo Hauha's insane record of kills made him the most prolific sniper in history, and to think he did it with an old rifle and iron sights. Field Marshal Carl Gustav Mannerheim promoted Simo to a junior officer. He would be highly decorated for his services to his country, being awarded the first and second class liberty medals, as well as the third and fourth class cross of liberty, an award normally reserved for officers along with the Kola Fighters Medal. He was nominated for Finland's highest honour, the Knight of the Mannerheim Cross, but this did not appear to have been granted. He was presented with a special honorary rifle with an engraved nameplate of the same type that he had used. This rifle is now on display at the Finnish Military Museum in Helsinki. However, it took him several years to fully recuperate from his severe facial injury, which required 26 separate sessions of reconstructive surgery, which still left him noticeably disfigured. Despite his amazing achievements, there were some small number who disapproved of what he did and disgracefully sent him death threats. His now very recognisable face made him avoid large groups of people, and he became highly introverted, hiding himself away from anyone other than his family. It would seem that the phenomenon of heroes being treated like garbage on Sibi Street is nothing new. He had a farm in Valkjarf in the municipality of Rokalati, which he worked for many years, spending his time hunting moose and breeding dogs. Finnish president Uro Kekonen accompanied Hauha on one of his hunting parties, which was at least a nice way of showing that he wasn't forgotten. But when work became too much for him, he was sadly forced to put the land up for rent, moving into an apartment instead. Throughout all of this time, he never married, remaining a bachelor his whole life. He never boasted about his achievements, rarely ever even speaking about them. Toward the end, Hauha was living in a care home for veterans. In 1998, someone asked him what had made him such a great sniper. The ever-modest Hauha simply replied, Practice. When interviewed as part of Finnish Independence Day celebrations in December of 2001, he was asked if he regretted having killed so many people. He replied, I did what I was told to do, as well as I could. There would be no Finland unless everyone else had done the same. Simo Hauha died on the 1st of April 2002, at the age of 96. Legacy Whilst there are some who have heard of Simo Hauha, very few outside of Finland know that much about him, let alone the whole Winter War. Sadly, until we get a movie about him, most still will not know. A bit how a lot of people, including yours truly, I have to admit, had never heard of Russian sniper Vasily Zaitsev before seeing the film Enemy at the Gates. Most definitely a candidate for another video. In 1983, a former infirmary building in the village of Mietala was turned into the Kola and Simo Hauha Museum, which tells of the man himself and the conflict in which he fought. Hauha was further immortalised in the song White Death by the very brilliant Swedish metal band Sabaton. If you love your history and a bit of metal, you will love Sabaton. I know I do. The 2022 film Sisu is said to be partially based on Hauha's legend, although more than a little over the top in how badass the character actually is. However, a proper biographical film has been in the works since 2017. Hopefully, we shall see it come to fruition, as I would love to go and see it. Seymour Hauha remains a true hero of his country that stepped up when it needed him the most. He and his memory deserves to be remembered. In the modern day, snipers in militaries all around the world could do a lot worse than look to Simo Hauha as an inspiration and a lesson in how to handle business. Thank you for watching this video. I do hope you found it informative and interesting. If you did, please hit the like button and consider sharing it with a friend. It literally takes a few seconds, and you'll be helping this video reach a wider audience. What did you think of Seymour Hauha? Let me know in the comments below.
Obviously, there has been more than a few words in this one that were in Finnish, which I have pretty much zero knowledge of outside of the names of a few sportsmen. So I apologise if I cocked up the pronunciations. I did my best to look them all up and copied what I heard as best I could. If you wish to do so, you can support DID on Patreon or via the Super Thanks button. A lot of my videos end up getting cock-blocked by YouTube, so I would greatly appreciate any contribution you can muster to help keep things ticking over. A huge thanks to my current patrons, you guys really are the best. And if you can't get enough of YouTube's foremost narrator, head on over to my alternate channel DID Reads to hear more. And in the meantime, take care of yourselves. And I shall see you on our next descent into darkness.